This morning we talked all about metagenomic taxonomic annotation. Yesterday you talked all about taxonomy. And finally you're going to not talk about taxonomy. So, um, learning objectives is, I'm going to discuss, you know, what just broadly we mean between functional composition versus taxonomic composition. Uh, I'm going to try to give you a really sort of overview, high level of the fact that there's different functional databases out there and sort of what my take is on some of them. Um, I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of maybe assembly and gene calling when we're doing functional annotation. Um, I'm going to walk you through how Humon actually works and then you'll use Humon and Stamp in the tutorial this afternoon to functionally annotate the same samples that you taxonomically annotated this morning. Okay, so functional composition, what are they doing? So obviously this morning we talked about taxonomics, so you get the list of the microbes and sort of who is there, whereas functional composition really answers what are they doing. So metagenomics provides the opportunity to catalog the entire set of genes from entire community, right? So you have to remember that these, um, these reads come from all the microbes, and some of these reads will actually contain parts or entire genes, but usually just parts of genes. And the idea is try to annotate those fragments with, uh, with some sort of functional annotation label. So what do we mean by function? I think this kind of came up maybe yesterday or this morning. It's all blending together. So, uh, so by function, we could be just talking very general about very loose terms like photosynthesis or nitrogen metabolism or glycolysis. And that's really obviously function at a very high level. Or we could be talking about really specific groups of orthologs. Anybody remember what an ortholog is? Anybody got a definition for me? Come on. Shut it out. Same function, different organism. Same function, different organism? Yep, pretty much. Anybody else? That's, that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, the phylogenetic in me sort of says, so usually they'd have to be phylogenetically related. You could have convergent evolution that would lead to the same function in different organisms, but that wouldn't be typically an ortholog, but yes. And then technically as well, orthologs don't necessarily always have to have the same function. But anyway, groups of, fiend, of genes across uh, families. And so this could be, say, something like NIFH, which is involved in uh, nitrogen fixation. It could be, uh, say, an EC number is a different type of classification, which is from the enzyme classification system. So 1.1.1 is alcohol dehydrated dehydrogenase, um, or it could be a different database like the KEG ortholog database, uh, which is K00929, which is uh, butyrate kinase, which is involved in the production of butyrate. So often we're talking about function, we could be specifically talking about a particular gene or a particular enzyme, or we could be talking about something more general like a pathway or, or a module. And so we're going to kind of relate these things together. So there's lots of various functional databases out there. I'm just going to run through a few of them. So the COG stands for Clusters of Orthogous Groups. It's been a classification that's been around for a long, long, long time. The actual database uh, hasn't really been updated since like 2003, which is like, I don't even know. Could you even sequence back then? I mean, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> I mean, that's a long time. Uh, but you'll still see the annotations. So COG annotations are the ones with the, those letters that usually have like R, T, S, I don't know what they are anymore, but uh, kind of a breakdown into about 12 to 15 different groups. They're still actually used quite a bit, so people annotate things and annotate them with called categories. Um, the seed is another uh, classification system. So the seed is actually used by systems like RAST and MGRAST. So MGRAST is this metagenomic server where you can upload your data. And then RAST is like a genome annotation system for microbial genomes. Uh, and so those system uses um, the seed system, so that's their type of functional annotation. Uh, PFAM is more focused on protein domains, although they do have whole genes as well, and they usually use uh, HMMs to describe the PFAMs. Eggnog is another one. It's more comprehensive. It has about 190,000 different uh, uh, gene families. UNRF is becoming, I think, more and more popular more recently. So UNRF is a prediction, um, sort of an automated clustering where they keep updating these clusters. And they're clustered kind of like OTUs are, where at, at different percentages, right? So UNRF 100 is, means that everything within that cluster is 100% identical. Uh, UNRF 90 would be 90% or less. Uh, UNRF 50 would be 50% or less. 
So if you go to reunion of 50, there's less families because they're grouped into uh, bigger groups. And then UF90 would have more, more gene families, but with tighter groups. So it's kind of nice because they're constantly updating it with all the new genomes that come out. And so it's uh, a few, or a few. I'm not going to talk about it much more today, but there are systems that are starting to use that in more detail in the future. Uh, the keg is very popular still. Uh, each entry is really well annotated. So if you've ever read papers, you'll probably often see these nice uh, metabolism charts. Um, and they link these keg orthologs, which I'll talk about in a second, to, into higher things like modules or pathways. Um, full access actually requires a fee now. They went private, I don't know, three or four years ago probably now, if I had to guess. Um, so people are still just kind of using the last snapshot of the database since then. But you can still go to the database and get annotations um, from the system. That's all open. But sort of the, the back files that includes all the sequences with those new keg orthologs isn't updated unless you have access to the private site. So people basically use the last snapshot and continue developing tools for it. Um, and slowly, I think we're starting to migrate away a little bit away from the keg. Um, and more people are starting to use things like, say, MetaPsych, which is the next one. Um, it's more microbe focused than the keg, which is kind of nice, whereas the keg is, has a lot of human functions. So my, uh, MetaPsych is an annotation system and classification system that's more focused on microbes. OK. Is there any favorite functional database that I missed in this one? No. What's that? Gene ontology, of course. Yeah, gene ontology. Yeah, absolutely. So gene ontology is another really common system. Um, and the nice thing about gene ontology is that it's an ontology. So you have this hierarchy structure where genes get mapped into more general and general categories. Um, yeah, absolutely. I need to update this with gene ontology. Uh, gene ontology is um, becoming maybe a little bit more used with microbes, but for a while it was a bit, it was very useful for human and other larger eukaryotes. But um, for microbes, again, some of the things, kind of like the keg, some of the genes aren't really well represented within microbes, but still, it's, it's still pretty widely used. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, so. Which ones would you recommend? Which ones would I recommend? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> uh, I think the, so the last three are probably the most, okay, so I would recommend, so I'm going to talk about keg today. So keg's great because whatever you find is really well described. So if you find something sniffingly different, it's well described, you can map it to modules or pathways, um, and you can make these nice pretty pictures, it's awesome. But the problem with the keg, and I don't know if I discuss this later, but whatever, we'll just discuss it now, is it's not as comprehensive, right? So the keg database has 10,000-ish keg orthologs, you know, gene families. Whereas um, eggnog has 190,000 different families. And like UNREF90, I think, has like 250,000 or more gene families. So what that means is that if you take your genes and you blast them or uh, similarity search against the keg orthologs, you're only going to annotate a certain percentage of those reads. Now, that happens for various reasons. One, maybe because there's no gene there, or two, because the there's just... Uh, not a significant finding, but it could just be because the keg orthologic database is not very comprehensive. So there's lots of genes out there we talked about this morning that we don't know their function, right? We don't know anything about them, so they're sort of left out in the dust of the keg or keg database. Um, so I, I think I think it makes more sense to move in a direction where at least we try to characterize gene families as most comprehensive as possible, and then if they're unknown, well, at least we identify them, and then later on we can try to worry about annotating them. So personally, I think uh, UNREF is a really good solution for this because they're automatically updated. You know, it's not someone's database that they made once and it's gone obsolete. It seems to be has staying power. Uh, power. And I'm starting to see new tools. I'm, I'm going to talk about Human uh, 1 today, but I know Human 2 is released, but it's not, public, uh, it's not um, published. So I decided not to describe the algorithm, whereas we're going to dig into Human. But I know with Human 2, they're using the UNREF 90 as their database, which is much more comprehensive. And I think that's much more satisfying, especially if you're working in an in environmental microbiome where you might have a lot of unknowns. Uh, and then MetaPsych seems really good, too. I just, I'm just not as familiar with the system. So um, MetaPsych uh, has nicer, in more depth, annotations for microbes.
So the direction I'd like to see is Uniref and Metasake. Uh, but for now, I think Keg's still a pretty good popular tool. Yeah. Is that satisfied? So you've done, you've done to adapt high-cost these new systems then, or more commonly new systems, because it kind of feels like it's a Hmm. Yeah, so um, PyCrest basically uses, um, it doesn't really matter, but what we do is we take all the genomes that have been sequenced and we use the annotations for those genomes. So if we can get this massive table of genomes with different types of functional categories and it's reliable, then PyCrest works with it. So we focused on KEG just for our validation, but we do have COG predictions. Uh, we do have RFAM predictions. And we started to play with MetaPsych, um, and we actually made it possible, but there was no validation, so we didn't really say that, you know, it's one thing to make a prediction, but when you have nothing to validate, it's like, I don't really want to let it out into the world. So um, it's definitely possible, and we can actually make the predictions. It's just we have to do some validation to make sure that it's accurate, like it was accurate for the KIG annotations. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm going to describe the keg, but I think this applies, a lot of this stuff applies to other databases, so it's just good to have sort of an idea of how these things are assembled. So with the keg database, the, the most specific unit is these keg orthologs. They're the most specific, and they're thought to be a particular gene that's doing some exact function. So now I've quoted like three different numbers of how many KOs are in the database. I should just look it up. <laughs> so now there's about 12,000 KOs in the database. Um, and then these are linked into keg modules and keg pathways. They have identifiers like K with five uh, numbers after it. Uh, and it's slightly confusing because people refer to them as keg orthologs or KOs, but then the identifier for keg pathway is actually KO, which is super confusing, I know, right? But keg orthologs or KOs are actually just a big K. And then pathways are actually these, these smaller prefix. But so if you go to the KEG database, if you get like a prediction from PyCrest or you get an annotation, it often has an ID. And you can just go to the KEG database and it'll tell you that's the entry. There's often a common name for the gene there listed. There's a longer definition of the, of the, of the protein product. And then it'll list different pathways that's associated with. So remember I told you that KEG orthologs are often grouped into multiple pathways, right? So this shows uh, that for this particular KO, it's involved in all these different pathways. It's also involved in these three different modules. And then it's also linked to this disease, right? So um, the KIG database tries to organize stuff into diseases as well. And it also has these bright hierarchies, which just basically breaks some of these pathways into more general categories as well. So KO is the bigger, or top, top hierarchy, and then you have these uh, modules, no. like I'm just no, the opposite. So keg orthologs are actually the most specific, the smallest thing at the bottom. Okay, the modules are bigger. The modules are bigger. Modules subset keg orthologs, and then pathways are even bigger than that. Oh. Yeah. So keg ortholog is the same as sort of like a gene name or something, if you want to associate that in your head. So it's a specific gene. Okay, so then you can group these keg orthologs into keg modules. Um, these are sort of mainly defined functional units. Uh, it's thought that there are small groups of KOs that function together. There's about 750 keg modules in the database, and they're labeled with this big M for module. What's cool about keg modules, that's different from keg pathways, is that they have this really well robust definition of what makes up a module. So it's not just a bag or uh, a loose clustering of, of keg orthologs. So in order for a module to be present in a genome, not a medic, but in a genome, it has to have a certain selection of keg orthologs. And so the way that they do this is they have a graphical representation as well as just a, a line here describing it. So to cover this particular module, which is glycolysis, um, you start at the top and you have to have at least for sure this, keg, uh, this KO, 1803. And then the next step, you can either have K11389 to get through this process, or you have to have one of these plus this one. And at the next step, you just have to have one of these to get through to the next step. You have to have this one for sure, and then one of these two. Does that make sense? And then if you have that, any sort of mixture of those to complete that, then you have that module present. And then so they just represent that with, uh, with 
put this syntax for the definition. The nice thing about that is you actually have some structure to it. And these, and these are a bit smaller. Whereas with KIG pathways, they're basically just these groupings of genes that are within a pathway. So there's about 230 different pathways. What's nice is that they do have these really nice, cool graphical maps. So you can pull them out. And then what's also really cool is you can often highlight your genes that are maybe significantly different across your metagenomes. And then you can over-represent or represent that in a nice graphical figure and relate it to the pathway. Um, so these are usually a little bit more general, and then even these pathways, you can, you can collapse those into even more general terms that aren't really biologically useful, but things just like amino acid metabolism and carbohydrate metabolism. All right, does that make sense? Rockin'. Okay, so for annotation systems that are out there, uh, basically, here's some of the ones I've listed. So for web-based, um, there's the EBI Metagenomic Server, so this is one of those servers where you just upload it. Uh, they do annotation. They use, uh, I think, Interpro in behind the scenes, which is quite slow if you try to do it on your own. But I guess they have these massive servers that just crank out the data. Um, MGRAS, I mentioned a couple times already, so um, MGRAS has been around for a few years. Their server tends to be, I'm really scared now that the audio is going to be online. <laughs> I just realized, anyway. But uh, MGRAS tends to be pretty good, but the, uh, the server's often down recently, so I think it's because you know a lot of people submit data, and then it sometimes goes down. And sometimes you don't know how long it's going to take to get your data back, so it could be a week or two weeks or, or more. Um, there's also a metagenomic annotation system through IMG slash M, uh, and through that I believe you have to sort of uh, go through an application. I think it's usually free, but it's through JGI, and I'm not quite sure how to go through that process, but I think it's free as far as I know, and then you can upload you it. You have to agree to your data and to get data ready before you can use that. And how do you For IMG, yeah? Yeah. Uh, join, join you know, yeah, yeah. Through the JGI, right? Yeah. Right. And that's all, though. That's not too bad. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying that's bad agreement. Right. Okay. Yeah. Anyone have experience with those? Thoughts? Okay, uh, and then GUI base, which is sort of more on your system, is Megan. I mentioned that this morning has been around for quite a while. Megan basically takes in a, like a blast output where you've already done the blast offline, and then you load it in, and then you can relate taxonomic to functions. Clover, I should really just strike this out. It was a virtual machine based uh, that contained sort of an SOP, but it hasn't been upgraded for a while now. That's going to get scratched soon. Um, and then sort of local based is there's Metamos was not made where you can sort of customize different things, what database you want to search with, do you want to do assembly or not, um, and lots of different options in there. Uh, it was pretty cool. I, when I was testing it, some of the features are a little buggy, and I think they've probably ironed out some of those, but if you're looking for something that's kind of, they've automated a lot of it, but you can maybe change different options, it sounds like a pretty good one. The do-it-yourself option, which is probably still massively done by a lot of people, is you just come up with your own pipeline, and that is super popular, and I go to posters, and people will always have a new metagenomics pipeline. It's pretty amazing. Um, and then Humon, I'm going to talk about um, uh, later on. Okay, so why the heck is this functional stuff so complicated? Why don't we just blast, you know, the NR database with my reads. So there's a few problems with that. One, Blast is really slow, right? So you have millions of reads, uh, pop probably, and then you have the NR database, which is millions of genes, and uh, it's going to be just really too slow. Next thing is that the top hit may not be the actual correct annotation for function, right? So we're thinking about functional annotation here now. So there's always problems with there's two different reasons why it could be wrong. One, it could be just that the annotations are on the database. Or two, it could be that the uh, top hit is 100% identical, and then you'll often get these ties between genes, and the top one doesn't actually match um, the second one, even though they're like 100% identical. So you'll get these sort of bad annotations, and it's hard to choose which one is which. Um, there could be a bias from uh, gene lengths or the database, 
So this has to come down to if you have a long gene, this is kind of like our discussion this morning about the size of the genome. So you can imagine if you have a bigger gene, the chance of hitting that gene with a read is actually more than a gene that's smaller. So again, if you're counting different functions in your table, you want to downweight those longer genes. So if you had a gene that's um, four times as long as this, another gene, then the chance of just hitting that is four times higher, and so that's going to be overrepresented when you're doing your counts. So some people will try to normalize for that gene length. Uh, and also there could be bias from the database where the database has been uh, obviously based on whatever's been sequenced in the past. And so if all your top hits are uh, basically the same thing over and over again, you actually don't see that it could be something else further down your list of hits. Uh, another problem is that sequencing depth is usually too shallow to cover all the DNA in the sample. So it's not like genomics where you would sequence a genome to say 30 times coverage and you have reads representing every single nucleotide in that genome and also all the genes. Um, since we're doing metagenomics and you have uh, sometimes thousands of different OTUs, the chance of actually getting a read from every single gene in your metagenome is unlikely unless you're doing a crazy amount of depth or the metagenome is uh, fairly uh, not too diverse. And then uh, the other thing is that if you want to then collapse these things into, say, keg modules or keg pathways, how do you really determine, how do you relate that into, into those things from those individual gene abundances? And the, a good example is if you have, you know, one gene from a whole pathway, does that mean I should count that pathway as one? Or do I divide by, say, the number of genes in that pathway? Or do I wait until I have most of the pathway before I actually count it at all? Okay. Any questions about that? This is um, metagenomics after assembly. I'm going to talk about assembly after. Is that right? So I was just wondering if another issue we discussed is how do you differentiate several genes being hit on more different parts of the content as well? Yeah, that'd be a problem. So I think if you do assembly and you have multiple genes from a, from a single thing, people will count each one of those hits. So do the tools like NGRAST and whatever, do they take that into account there for any content that might be 2,000 bases long? Right. Might have multiple genes on it. I think so, yes. Yeah. And then I think they'll collapse it, right, so that they know that they're, these hits are all to the same area, so we don't count those multiple hits. It's the, you know, the hits to different areas in the gene. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is the sort of human pipeline, and I'm going to sort of break it down step by step. So the first step is the step that basically all uh, functional annotation pipelines will have is some similarity search to a database. So in this case, they're doing a translated BLAST against uh, this cake ortholog database. Does everyone know what translated BLAST is? No. So BLAST by itself is, there's different flavors of BLAST. So BLAST N would be a nucleotide versus nucleotide search. BLAST P would be a a protein query search against a protein database. Uh, BLAST X, which is a translated BLAST, is a nucleotide query. And then you search it against a protein database. And so you search all six frame translations of your nucleotide sequence. Three in forward and then three in the reverse. And then the last one is TBLAST X, which is translated query and the translated database. Does that make sense? So often people are doing functional annotation in protein space. So they're searching a protein database, which if you're interested in non-protein genes, then you would not want to do this, right? So it's something to keep in mind if you're interested in RNA genes um, or other interesting things that you can annotate DNA with that we're mostly talking about proteins. The reason that we're doing a protein uh, search is just because uh, one, we can make it a bit quicker, I'll show on the next slide, but also proteins allow for more conservation over time, so you, it would be no, more noisy with the BLAST sort of end search. All right, does that make sense? Yay. Oh, yeah, sorry, so is that a... Jeez, that's kind of brutal, aren't I? Yeah, sorry, so this is that a Curtis Hutton Howard's group. <laughs> 
So, yeah, that's really weird. Sorry, I thought I had it listed. Okay. Yeah, so sorry, human is um, out of the Chris Hutton Howard groups. It sounds like human only. I should mention that as well, but people do use it not just for humans um, because it is the keg database. So uh, there's nothing really focused just on humans. They just happen to call it human. And there's some long acronym, and I don't know what it is, but you can look it up. Um, and it was used, though, for the Human Microbiome Project as their main annotation tool. Okay, so I said earlier BLAST is slow, and so people have been developing faster methods to do faster similarity search. So after BLAST came out, uh, there was faster tools like, has anyone heard of BLAT? Maybe? BLAT's a tool that makes nucleotide searching a lot faster. Um, there was this other tool called RAP Search, and then RAP Search 2, which does protein searches even faster than BLAT. Um, and then more recently, uh, Diamond came out, uh, man, I don't have my references in here, sorry, <laughs> last year, um, and they claimed that they had a massive speed up over, uh, over Blastex. So this is a figure from the paper, and they show that compared to, uh, compared to Blast, they could get almost a 20,000 fold speed up over, over Blastex, which is pretty amazing. And then they also show in these two figures that there's, uh, that hopefully they still get the right answer. So uh, this just shows different types of data and the bars just show the uh, correct queries mapped using the search methods. So they compared against RAP search 2 as their main uh, competitor to comment. So they're doing fairly well across uh, the queries mapped. And then if they look at the matches recovered from BLAST, that they do fairly well, uh, fairly well as well. Um, just from our own tests, basically Diamond does really good if your similarity is fairly high. So it seems like anything above sort of 80% would do very well. If you're looking for really divergent sequences, say in the 30 to 50% identity range, uh, Diamond doesn't always give you the best hit because it does do things to speed it up. So if you're looking for very diverged proteins, you'd be probably better off sticking with BLAST and just waiting. <laughs> but with 20,000 fold uh, increase, I mean, basically this means that we can get stuff done without a massive cluster sometimes. So in the example today you'll run, things run in about a few minutes, and then we calculate it one time, and it would take BLAST about a couple of days to do that same search. So. When you have so much data, sometimes you just have to use whatever will process the data. Okay, so uh, the next step that, so the first step is to do that, that search, uh, and that currently is outside of Human right now, so you'll do that search in your tutorial. And then the second step is then to start to process these searches and then start to come up with hopefully what you want at the end is both pathway and module information at the end. So the first step they do is they try to normalize and weight the search results. So you can imagine they have all these different hits to uh, different things in the database, and they try to normalize those hits using a few different approaches. So uh, one, they always take into account how many reads map to the gene sequence in that KO, and then they weight those by the inverse p-value of each mapping. So the lower the p-value, sorry, the higher the p-value, then the less weight it will have to normalizing that data. Um, and then the other thing they do is they take into account the average length of a keg ortholog, and then they divide by the average length of that keg ortholog to come up with a normalized score. So right at this stage already, you're going from real read counts to all of a sudden some decimal number that's been altered based on um, the, the similarity to the keg ortholog as well as the gene length. Does that make sense? Right. Okay, so the next step is then this problem where I mentioned how do you take into account if you have one or two keg orthologs um, of a pathway, how do you start to count that? So as I mentioned already, a keg ortholog can map to one or more keg pathways, but just because we find one keg ortholog or a few in a pathway, it doesn't actually mean that exists in the community. And that's important because maybe that pathway represents something that's not actually actively occurring. So uh, for this, they just basically wrap an, a previous tool that was developed called MinPath. And MinTap 
uh, MinPath attempts to sort of remove spurious hits. So their idea is that you have all these kegos mapping to different pathways, and you try to remove pathways that aren't well covered. The next step uh, is that they use um, organism information from the keg hits. So they look at pathways that are not found to be observed in uh, to be observed in any organisms, and they're also made up mostly of KOs mapping to a different pathway um, are removed. So this is the idea that if most of the keg orthologs look like they belong to this pathway and they're not known to be associated with this other pathway, they just basically remove them. Um, the other thing that to take into account is this estimated copy number. So this kind of relates back to 16S copy number. So you can imagine if a genome has multiple copies, they actually try to normalize for that. So they're only representing a, a single copy of a keg ortholog within a genome. And then finally, they do one last step where they try to do some uh, smoothing and gap filling. And this is the idea that, that they know that people with metagenomics have usually not done enough sequencing to sample all the genes. And so just because you're missing a gene from a pathway doesn't mean that's actually missing your metagenome. It could be just that you've had low sampling depth. And so they try to, they try to increase keg orthologs uh, that they think are actually present that just haven't been sequenced. Okay, and then the last step is that they basically have now two types of data. So one is pathway coverage, which is a present absence. So this is just saying for the metagenome, do we think that this pathway is at least covered completely? And that's just a present absent thing. And then the abundance actually takes into account the relative abundance, which is much more informative. So usually I don't use coverage for anything. And I want to look at the relative abundance of both pathways and these keg modules. All right, does that make sense? So that's human in a nutshell. Great. All right, so what about assembly? So uh, I think Will got asked about assembly a little bit yesterday. So just as a quick recap, assembly is the process where we have these fragmented reads and DNA. The idea is we're gonna find overlap between the reads and the hope is that we assemble these reads into contates. And then later again, you can do assembling contates possibly in the scaffolds where you don't know for sure if something, what the sequence is between the contates, but you know the relative <coughs> order. So what about assembly? So assembly for metagenomics. So there's pros and cons to whether you want to do assembly first and then do functional annotation, or whether you do functional annotation directly on the raw reads. Okay, so this is a lot of my thoughts, but this is, could be interesting if you have questions. So on the pro side for metagenomics, um, there's less computational time for that similarity search. So since you're collapsing now millions of reads into an assembled contig, that means when you actually do your functional annotation search, then you're only comparing this collapsed thing to your database. So instead of millions, you could have maybe thousands or 100 to 1,000 less uh, fold. The easiest is if you can imagine if these are all 100% identical reads, then you wouldn't want to have to do that search over and over and over again. You could just do it, collapse them first, and do the similarity search once. So that's a benefit. Um, if you have short reads, especially this is a little bit more worrisome when high seq was generating like 75 base pairs. But since you assemble these reads into longer contigs, it could increase your ability to actually assign annotation. So you can imagine if you have short reads that that limits your ability to actually find uh, a search to a protein. The other cool thing about it is that you can actually sometimes reconstruct uh, genomes. So that's useful somewhat if you just do assembly on the whole thing, but some people will try to do some binning first and then assemble the leftover with the hope of actually pulling out at least partial genomes from your metagenomes. Okay. Uh, so the pros cons is that although you save time on the similarity search, uh, assembly on full metagenomes is really computationally intensive. So you actually need a pretty mi big machine with a lot of memory, uh, and those aren't always available for all people in all labs. So unless you have access to a machine with at least 128 and probably more like 256 or 512 gigs of memory, 
um, assembling a full metagenome is probably out of your luck. But if you know a buddy, then you're then you're good. <laughs> um, you have to keep track of the collapse reads. So this was kind of a weird point, but for a while people were doing assembly and then they were just throw out the fact that multiple reads map to different assembled pieces. But now there's some assemblers that will keep track of the reads back to the assembly or you have to do it yourself. So you can imagine if you collapse all these reads into the assembly and then you annotate that, you'd actually want to keep track of the reads that originally mapped to it. So some assemblers will do that, but in others times you just have to do the mapping back yourself and, and keep track of those counts. Uh, what else? Low read depth and high diversity can cause assemblers to fail. So again, you have this problem with shallow sequencing. You have thousands of different things. The chance of it just to fail and not work very well is, is very high. And what else do we have? Chimeras. So the hope is that the assembler would do a pretty stringent job of only assembling things that are from the actual same genome. But there's a chance that it could assemble things from different strains or even maybe different species if it thought that the overlap was good enough. And so you actually could get these chimeras of things that don't represent sequences from the exact same genome, which could cause problems downstream. Okay, and lastly, uh, there's a chance for this, although I still haven't seen any study to show if this is a big problem or not, is that uh, if you do assembly on whole metagenomes, you can imagine that you would be able to assemble some of the more dominant things in the sample, where the more rare things would be not assembled as much. And so if there's, uh, that could change how you do functional annotation. So the, it could bias your ability then to label functions in the more rare things because those are shorter reads. Although I don't have any proof that that's actually effective or a problem, but just something to keep in mind. Genome complexity? Yeah, the bigger regions, stuff like that. Right. It's harder to yeah, absolutely. So, and then that would affect your functional annotation as well, right? So you, right, you would miss, um, so 16S uh, ribosomal operons are, or ribosomal operons are really hard to often annotate or assemble. And so, because there's multiple operons usually, and so they'll get left out of assembly, and then all of a sudden you can't annotate those genes, if, although with, a lot of those are RNA genes, but yeah. So anyway, it's just something to be cautious of, but still, uh, assembly is still quite often used by a lot of metagenome pipelines. So as far as I know, JGI still puts all of their uh, metagenomes through a gene assembly process to get contigs uh, before moving on with their parts. My preference right now is to just do it on the raw reads and it removes some, some bias that way. Any thoughts on that? Any thoughts from the speakers about assembly versus not? John, you're an assembler, aren't you? Um, not with metagenomic data. Hmm. Okay. Do you guys assemble your genome? No one? No. I didn't. Well, so either, so there's two things, I guess. It didn't assemble very well. Um, and then the other thing is that, that I'm also worried about that last point, right? You have, especially if you're trying to do comparison between two environments and you have one that has more organisms that are. Um, Simpler, and you have one that is really large organisms that aren't, you know, that are, have just more variety. One is going to assemble much better than the other, and right. then that could be contribute to annotation effects as well. Right. So, I guess it comes down to how well the actual um, algorithms perform across different data sets. And the assemblers. The assemblers, and presumably some assemblers are much better than the assemblers. So there's way metrics in there now. Right. Yeah, and I don't want to come back to the pro that I think there's useful things to do with assembly and metagenomics, but if you're really interested in just getting to 
sort of the taxonomy table and then the functional table by themselves. I think you can do that with the raw reads and that's what the tutorial will show you. But there's other times where you might really want to do something that requires assembly, right? So this idea of binning reads possibly and then reconstructing genome somewhat or um, if you need something where you actually need the longer reads, like if you're trying to find LGT or something, then that really requires an assembly. But you have to remember that you know assemblers work great on genomes where you know that they're supposed to fit together. Um, most of the time, I mean, it, assemblers have to handle chromosomes, right? But uh, originally, they weren't really designed for metagenomes where you have hundreds or thousands of chromosomes or different genomes, right? So you just have to keep in mind that and these things can be really similar. So if you have a population with different strains, you could get these chimeric assemblies. That kind of scares me a bit. OK. Um, so what about gene calling? So that's the next step. So in genomics, uh, normally you would take your reads, and you would do an assembly, and then you would do a gene call. Uh, and so for gene calling, uh, if you're not familiar with it, this is just the idea that you're going to try to predict the start and stop side of an actual gene within your genome. So you can imagine an open reading frame is uh, identifying uh, nucleotides that code for amino acids, and then you uh, gene callers will look for uh, open reading frames over a certain size without a stop codon, and then they use gene models from other sequence genomes to identify uh, the probability of that gene being a real gene. So um, for metagenomics, some people might then want to do a gene caller first before then you try to actually assign functional annotation. So the pros in that approach is that you may result in less false positives from not annotating non-real genes. So you can imagine if you have a DNA sequence, you find a match in some open reading frame, but it's mostly like a domain or something to another gene, but it might not even been a real gene in the first place, especially if it was a shorter hit. Uh, whereas if you did a gene caller, then maybe you would have less false positives that way. Uh, again, it would lower the number of similarity searches, so it would cut down on computational time on that end because you actually have less things to do the functional annotation with. Uh, again, again, similar to assembly, on the cons, the gene callers are quite computationally intensive by themselves, right? Um, so it takes a long time. Uh, I like my English, no good learning data set. Anyways, <laughs> um, so uh, usually with genomes, people would build gene models based on sort of known model organisms. And so they would train these models. And with metagenomics, all of a sudden you have things that people have never seen before, right? So genes you've never seen before or organisms that you've never seen before. And so there's not great gene model. Uh, it's really hard to come up with a nice learning data set to, to build those training programs for those. Uh, the other big thing is that often if you're looking at raw reads, right? A gene call, you wouldn't actually necessarily have the start, might not have the stop, or you might even have the start or stop. You might just have the fragment from the middle, and so that causes a problem for gene callers. Uh, so because of that, people would often do assembly first. So the people that tend to assemble, they sometimes often also use a gene caller. Um, and so the gene callers that are out there specifically for metagenomics will allow for, say, the start or stop to be missing, so they don't actually have that, the, that restriction. Uh, so I mentioned metagene annotator here as well as frag gene scan, and I think there's been others as well. So the alternative is to not do gene calling at all, and you just say do your six-frame translation using Blastex or Diamond, and that's sort of the approach I do. Yeah? This is mostly for bacteria, I guess. What if you have the bacteria to and stuff like that? I guess this wouldn't work at all. The gene calling? Yes. Um, no, I wouldn't say that. I actually don't know. <laughs> I think it would work. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? So there's gene callers for obviously for eukaryotes, and I'm just I don't know if they've been adapted for metagenomes. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Uh, is there a specific organism you're thinking about? No. Well, because we're like, it is like the uh, soil samples and looking for nematodes and stuff like that. So I, I guess the issue then 
Yeah, I think that might be a better approach where you, you exactly you try to filter your eukaryotic reads first and then say these are eukaryotic ones, so we're going to do something different with them. We can still carry out assembly and then at the counting level identify that they're eukaryotic. Yeah, it's a good point. I think if you if you thought if you were going after eukaryotes assembly and then trying to do gene calling that way might be the better approach for eukaryotes. Yeah. So we work with some uh, Giardia samples that have very few introns, but nevertheless do so. We treat them separately. Well, not that we treat them separately. So we had to use sort of gene, fi uh, gene finders that are more specific by handling eukaryotes and um, and the ones that. Right. Anyway, good point. Yep. So I'm going to give two details of how I'm using my data. So I'm starting to bring up a bit of data out of my deck. So it's beginning to get a little bit of a question, but I'm starting to get confused. When you put that, the stuff you're talking about here, how is it showing the data? So if you do assembly, how is it showing? So that's the thing. So, um, So the, the classic example is is you would get to this point where then you have a table right with these functions, and then people group the functions into their, their different categories, right? So similar with what we get with PyCrest with this keg ortholog table with multiple samples, and then people will do statistics to say, oh that's interesting. We see the microbiome has a greater proportion of these particular um, carbohydrate metabolizing genes, right? And so we think. Um, that's right, yeah. So, I mean, the classic one is something like butyrates, right? So with humans, we know that butyrate is kind of important for, um, it's linked to colorectal cancer, and it's uh, it's known to cross the intestine, and so it's, it's seen as a sort of healthy aspect. And so you can look for genes that are in butyrate production, right? So butyrate kinase or something. And then people will then um, show that maybe the microbiome is making more or less, say, butyrate, which has been linked to to other diseases, and so that's interesting. Um, but it could be other functions too that people have no idea, right? I mean, so you're, you're going through the PyCrest data, but so you start to make decisions about, about that data based on, on what the microbiome as a community is doing. So that's in the sort of what I would call the, the most straightforward analysis, and that's what you're going to be doing in the tutorial. Um, and then there's other things that people start to do maybe with the genome reconstructions where maybe they're really trying to describe, say, a new a new, meta, a new genome that's never been described before, right? And so they try to do metagenome reconstruction. Um, or they're trying to link um, the functions back to the to the specific organisms through the assembly or something like that. But I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do with the, with the sequences beyond just making the functional table. But that's what I'm focusing on, on here. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is uh, my sort of pet peeve number two. It's kind of like pet peeve number one this morning. Um, so just so when you're writing papers, again, just to make sure that if you're doing a metagenome, we're not talking about actual transcripts or proteins, right? We're measuring genes. So um, it's so the, the big thing around that is we're talking about sort of function potential. So just because, of course, we see an increase in the relative abundance of genes within the microbiome doesn't necessarily mean that those be, are being actively transcribed or then translated into proteins, which are then having an actual impact in the gut. That being said, I think people tend to think, and this would be interesting to have opinions about this, that, um, that the community in general is pretty selective on the organisms and that if you do see a, a, an increase or a decrease in maybe the presence of the genes, you can assume that those things are just actually being transcribed. Not, uh, that's not the right way. <laughs> that, uh, that they could be useful and that it does show sort of potential for a gain or loss in function. But you're not actually measuring the transcripts without actually doing the metatranscriptomics, right? So you just have to be aware that you're not actually measuring, say, uh, butyrate levels, right? In any way, you're just saying you see an increase, say, in butyrate, uh, the ability for the microbiome to generate butyrate, and you would have to measure the metabolite separately or the transcript separately. <laughs>
Does that make sense? Okay, good stuff. All right, so um, that's my summary. I have a quick summary slide. So remember I showed this before, but I think this is where we're at now over the two days. So the hope is here is that you can generate both OTU tables using 60 nuts data or CHAN. Uh, this morning you showed, I showed you how you take metagenomics data and use Metaflan to get to the same sort of taxonomic table. So it's not an OTU table, but it's the same sort of data, right, where you have things grouped into a species or genus or family. And then from there you can use STAT to generate these types of plots. Um, and then yesterday I showed you how to get from the OTU table from 60 nuts data using PyCrust to get to the functional. Uh, and then now we're going to show you how to go from shotgun med genomics data uh, and using Qmon and Diamond to actually get the, the keg log table uh, through that method. And then you're going to use STAMP to check out some of the functional differences. Does that make sense so far? Rocket, any questions? Sorry, what was that? Those are not really stand out to the uh, No, that's a bit of a lie. <laughs> this one is. This is. Yeah. That's not. This is. That's Chime. I made this in error. This is Chime. Yeah, this is like a hand wavy stamp idea, not like stamp. Sorry. <laughs> stamp slash other tools I should put in here. Yeah. Well, they do quite different things. For visualization, you mean? Yeah. Well, so um, they just give you sort of different things. That's not a very good answer. So for like, um, China does a great job with Unifrac and their PCA plots, you know, with Emperor and stuff. That's pretty slick. Um, but if I'm looking at separate taxa and separate functions, I really like stamp for that because I can go through and then it draws it for me. Whereas with stamp, with pipe, uh, chime, you uh, you can do that as well, but it's just a little bit more clunky. You have to make each plot from the command line, and it's a little more clunky. Uh, you can make heat maps in stamp, and I don't think you can make heat maps in chime. Just from what I remember. Um, and then really big heat maps, I would prefer to do in R because that's just what I like to do. Um, stack bar charts, I often do in chime. Uh, when you're looking at multiple, but you can do those and other things too. So I, I think it's just what you kind of get used to. Yeah. Okay. So for the lab this afternoon, um, like I said already, there was the uh, the same starting data set you're going to look at, and this time you're going to do diamond similarity search, and then you're going to look at that output, and then you're going to do a humana to get your pathways and modules, and you're going to load that up in to uh, STEM. There is a step where for all the samples, we mentioned that you don't actually have to run all the samples through Diamond because it would sort of take too long. You can give it a whirl. Actually, I put how, I think I updated how long it is. I think it's actually only about 10 minutes or 10, 15 minutes. So if you want to feel satisfied, you can just run it and not use the pre-computed results or maybe run it while you're doing something else with the pre-computed results, but you'll see how it gives you your output. So I'd, I'd encourage that. You can run all so the Amazon cluster has eight threads, right? So eight different threads and quite a bit of memory. So you can parallel things up to eight times and really crunch through the data. It's kind of satisfying just to, I don't know why it's satisfying to me. I bought this machine that has 48 threads and I just love just loading it up with data. I can't even see the machine, but I just picture it in this place just going Anyway, it's just me, I guess. Uh, <laughs> just trying to think if there's any other questions or comments. No, yeah, so um, I'm sure there's questions or comments. Oh, there is one thing I want to show you. So that's the end of the lecture. Okay.